guys, it's Emily, and today, in honor of March Mystery Madness, I'm here to bring you my second mystery history talk. And today, instead of focusing on a particular murderer, like I did last year, I'm going to be talking about the book The Art of the English Murder by Lucy Worldsley, and specifically her, um, outline of the history of murder as entertainment in England, and I'm really excited to talk to you today. So murder really became a hot topic in England in 1811. There was this murder called the Radcliffe Highway um, Murders in London, and there's two families that lived on the Radcliffe Highway were murdered in their bed within the span of a few days and there was a huge panic and the constable was under pressure to arrest someone so they did arrest a person and he was taken to jail and he later committed suicide in jail and his body was paraded through the streets um but present day research doesn't really show any connection between him and the murder so there was sort of this um fear and people were afraid because you know, the Industrial Revolution had changed how people lived, people had moved to cities, and safety was a huge concern because you're no longer near your neighbors. And what police existed then were corrupt and inefficient. They would take payments from criminals, and, you know, there wasn't any formal police until 1829 when the, the Metropolitan Police was created. And the first police detectives weren't created until 1842. And so people had always been interested in murder. Um, public hangings had always been popular. And then the um, Madame Tussard um, created waxworks of murder scenes, and those were very popular. People wanted to spend their time looking at things that were related to murders. And if they couldn't see those murders, they wanted to read about them. And this genre of paper called papers newspapers called penny bloods became very popular which were like one page sheet, sheets and then later magazines that detailed murders and hangings and crazy crimes that had happened and victorian this took place in the victorian era and victorians of all classes began to enjoy these penny bloods as the price of paper fell and so more people could afford them Charles Dickens was one of the first writers that sort of set the popularity of English detectives in motions. Detectives were really disliked and actually seen as busybodies that weren't minding their own business when they were going around looking, investi for looking for clues and, clues and investigating crimes. But Dickens started going with them on their beats and he started talking up their skills and he published Bleak House as a serial in 1852 and 1853. And some people consider that to be the first detective novel novel because there's a character named in Inspector Bucket who saw a murder in that book. And Dickens also attended the public hanging of Frederick and Maria M Manning, who were um, who were hanged for killing Maria's lover in 1849. But afterwards, he sort of wrote about his disgust at the voyeurism that he felt when he was watching all these people get really excited about the death and the hanging. And society sort of sort of started taking that same view as well. The last public hanging took place in 1868. And so people became more interested in how criminals were caught versus how they were actually punished. This fascination with how the criminal was caught led to a fascinate, led to an interest in poison, with poisonings in the Victorian age. Medical examiners became crucial to murder trials as they could show how poisons worked. And poisonings in general demonstrated that crime was sort of moving up the chain, so to speak, because you had to have an education and, you know, a pretty good intellect to success to successfully poison someone. And Worsley discusses a doctor named William Palmer who poisoned his best friend, his wife, and more than one of his children. And it, it was actually his habit of getting life insurance right before he these people died rather than actual proof that connected him to poison that got him, you know, arrested and later um, locked up and hanged for the murder. In addition to being interested in how detectives solve crimes, people started having what's called 
what was called detective fever, and they wanted to figure out who done it. And in 1860, there was a murder called the Roadhouse, the Road Hill House murder, and a four-year-old boy had been murdered inside a locked house, and the only people that were in the house were members of his family. And so there were there were multiple family members that were questioned and accused, but the the police mishandled the case. Um, they left evidence, you know, that was significant, and they stopped through the crime scene without, you know, blocking it off. And so there was a local committee of citizens that formed to investigate the crime, and this was sort of the first group of amateur detectives. And Scotland's yard's failure to solve this murder actually damaged their reputation for a long time, and they were also involved in several betting scandals in the 1860s and 1870s. That sort of best that destroyed their population, their popularity as well. And you can sort of see that it's very telling that prior to World War II, most of the very popular detectives in fiction, um, Sherlock Holmes, Lord Peter Win Winsy, and Perrault, are all amateur or private detectives rather than detectives working for the police. The idea that crime was becoming more of an like middle and upper class concern led to the popularity of sensation novels. And sensation novels took place at a country house and had a limited number of suspects and had an amateur detective solving the crime. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. Wilkie Collins is considered um, a sensation novel. And again, it's another one that people consider the first detective no novel. And um, I'm planning to read The Moonstone for March Mystery Madness, so I was really excited to see this it featured in this book. But I will, will warn you that the ending of this of The Moonstone is spoiled in the book. So if you're planning to read it, do not read that chapter about sensation novels. There's also an, um, another sensation novel mentioned in the chapter, which is Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. And Worsley actually discusses how the novel takes after Braddon's own life. Another famous novel that Worsley mentions is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, and she particularly mentions how the play version of, the, of that work premiered in 1888, which was just when Jack the Ripper began his streak of murders, and the actor playing Jekyll and Hyde in this play did the transformation so well between Jekyll and Hyde that some people even believed that he might be the killer. And the popularity of this play and of the actor actually affected people's perception of Jack the Ripper. There was a widely held belief, and people still believe it today to some extent, that Jack was like a well-to-do doctor that was leading a double life, you know, rather than some random guy off the street. There was another famous creation that emerged in 1888 as well, and that was Sherlock Holmes who was created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he reflects the increasing sophistication that the police were developing in how they caught criminals and how they prevented crimes. Forensic science, was, which is sort of the studying of the small details, such as dirt or um, germs or hair or blood or little things that are left at the scene of crimes, was becoming very key to solving murders. Holmes uses experiments on corpses, um, fingerprinting, toxicology, things like that, and just seeing the details where no one else does to catch the criminals. And he was, Holmes was actually held up as an example to officers learning how to do this forensic science when they were studying crime scenes. And he also just, uh, Holmes also um, started the trend of disguising yourself when you go investigate a crime, which is a tactic that's now popular with police in real life and also other fictional detectives. Holmes's last appearance um, in print came in 1927, and by then there was a new type of crime fiction emerging, and it was sort of a quieter time. World War I had sort of affected the British mindset, and it had definitely affected the British population. And so these new quiet crime novels set in um, country houses were sort of calming the nerves. And Holmes was known for being adventurous, you know, climbing around the moors and fighting by waterfalls. And people didn't really want adventure in the post-World War II, one years. They wanted a tidy solution, in, you know, in a country house. And so they, the, the, well, 
what is called now the golden age of crime began. And two of the ultimate golden um, age of crime writers were Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers. And Worsley just dedicates a chapter to each woman um, discussing how her personal life affected her detective detective fiction. Agatha Christie is known for disappearing for a few days because she was having some marital problems and that was in 1926. And Dorothy L. Sayers had a child out of wedlock and was passionate about finding women finding their own way in the world and her novels reflect these um, beliefs and these events in her life. There were so many detective writers in the Golden Age that they formed a detective club that had its own constitution and rules that mysteries that their mis, rules that their mysteries had to follow, which included the detective can't kind of committed the, the crime, and the club also had an oath that you had to take and an and an initiation ceremony that included a real human skull named Eric. But as World War Two came and then finished, there was a backlash against Golden Age detective fiction because the book sort of ignored real life, and that was partially due to the conservatism of the detective club, and class was seen as a huge part of these uh, Golden Age books. Servants were sort of seen as less than human, and certainly not as intelligent enough to have created a um, exciting murder, and everybody of importance in these Golden Age stories is a lord or a lady, and the murder itself is never really described in any detail. So all of these things seemed out of place as people began to sort of have less trust in authority. And the idea that the villain was pure evil and the detective pure goodness sort of lost popularity as rehabilitation of criminals became more popular. So the thriller began to dominate, starting with James Bond's um, first appearance in 1952, and then continuing on to the present day. The thriller still dominates today, of course, but there certainly is a, still a love for the more traditional Golden Age mysteries in both print and media. British mysteries like uh, BBC Sherlock, Royals War, Father Brown, they're all really popular all over the world, and there certainly remains an interest in murders and in crazy crimes, and Worsley makes the point in her conclusion that the elevation of interest in murder is a direct result of civilization, the death penalty was limited, poison and life insurance became a bit more widely available, and we began moving away from close-knit communities where everybody knows their neighbors. And so despite the criticisms of golden age detective fiction, we still do like knowing that the murder will be solved by the end of the book, or if there's a cliffhanger, that there's another book on the way. And so that was The Art of English Murder by Lucy Worsley. Uh, these, I definitely recommend this book. Uh, a lot of, there was a lot of detail in here that I had to leave out in the interest of making this a relatively short video. Uh, if you're interested at all in the history of murder in England, or if you're interested in learning more about where some of the popular um, murder, murder mysteries of today came from, um, definitely check this out. There's also a TV series based on this book called A Very British Murder that is available on BritBox if you have Amazon Prime, which I have not watched yet, but I really want to. So yeah, I really enjoyed this book, and I highly recommend it, and I hope everybody's having a great March Mystery Madness, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye!